Determine the domain of the following functions and express your answers using interval notation. So our first function, g of x, is equal to the square root of 8 minus 3x divided by 2x plus 1. Has a lot going on. This function's got a lot going on. Let's look at the numerator. Because we have a square root in the numerator, we definitely have some domain restrictions. Because remember, you cannot have a negative inside of a square root if we are in the real number system. Because a negative in a square root would create an imaginary number. So what is inside that square root, and the fancy name for this, just to review a little vocabulary, that's called the radicand. So what is inside that square root, it must be positive or zero. It must be positive or zero. So that means that the quantity 8 minus 3x must be greater than or equal to zero. In other words, it cannot be negative, it must be positive or zero. So we're going to solve that inequality here in just a second. But there is a second restriction because we also have division. We have a, a fraction here. And we know that we cannot divide by zero. That would be undefined. So we have to also consider that this denominator cannot equal zero. So there's an additional restriction. 2x plus 1 cannot equal zero. So we have to solve both of these uh, inequalities and equations. Let's start with what I have in red. 8 minus 3x is greater than or equal to 0, so we will subtract 8. And then divide by negative 3. And remember, when you divide by a negative, multiply or divide by a negative, the inequality symbol must flip. So that becomes x is less than or equal to 8 thirds. So we know that the domain values, which are all the possible x values, they need to be smaller or equal to 8 thirds for starters. But we have an additional restriction. If 2x plus 1 cannot equal 0, then if we subtract 1, that means 2x cannot equal negative 1. And if we divide by 2, that tells me that x cannot equal negative 1 half. Because if we did substitute negative 1 half in for x, we would get 0 in the denominator. And division by 0 is undefined. So we have two sets of restrictions. And before I write my answer in interval notation, I'd like to show you what this looks like on a number line, because the number line often will help students write their final answer appropriately. So what I have in red says x must be less than or equal to 8 thirds. So I'll just stick 8 thirds over here. And in red, I'll show that means x can be any number to the left, any number smaller than 8 thirds over here, or equal to 8 thirds. So I'll use a bracket to indicate that I'm including 8 thirds. However, what I have in blue says that x cannot equal negative 1 half. So negative 1 half is smaller than 8 thirds, so it would be somewhere over here to the left. And basically, I want to skip over negative 1 half. You might have seen like an open dot notation in the past to indicate that we're not including negative 1 half. That would be fine. Or you could use parentheses, which is how we'll actually write our answer in interval notation. So starting from the left and working our way to the right, we can see we're going to have from negative infinity to negative 1 half. Those are all possible x values. But I'm going to use a parenthesis to indicate that I cannot have negative 1 half. I'm skipping over it union with all the values between negative one-half and eight-thirds, but I'll use a bracket to indicate that I'm keeping eight-thirds, that it is in the domain. X can be eight-thirds. That's okay. Because if I did substitute in eight-thirds for X, I would get zero in the numerator, which is totally fine. Now, if you want to be fancy, you can say X is an element of this interval. That's not required, but I just don't want you to be scared of that notation when you see that element symbol. That's just telling you, hey, these are intervals. They are x intervals, and those are the domain values. Moving on to b, f of x is equal to the natural log of x squared minus 4. So for b, we have this quantity that we're taking the natural log of, which is x squared minus 4. And again, to review a little vocabulary, what you're taking the, the log of, or the natural log of, that is called the argument. So our argument is x squared minus 4. And we have restrictions here, because the argument of a logarithm must be positive. 
In other words, you can't take the log of a negative number and you can't take the log of zero. Now, if you don't remember why that is, that's another discussion for a different video. So please, let's dive deeper into that at a later time. But important to know, you cannot take the log of a negative or a zero. So the argument, which is x squared minus four, must be positive. In other words, it must be greater than zero. So now we're solving an inequality, but this is a different type of inequality than the previous inequality. Let me show you the difference. The inequality we solved over here on part A, this was a linear inequality. And when you're solving a linear inequality, you get to solve those like linear equations, as long as you remember that when you're multiplying or dividing by that negative, the inequality sign flips. However, what we have right here is not linear because you see we have x squared. That's an exponent of a two. This is a quadratic inequality. So we have to be really careful because we cannot solve quadratic inequalities like quadratic equations. And what I mean by that is a quadratic equation would look like x squared minus four is equal to zero. And you might see somebody add four and then square root both sides and say the solutions are plus or minus two, for example. That would be appropriate if it was an equation. There were only two solutions. But in this case, we have an inequality and there are a lot, an infinite number of values that will cause x squared minus four to be greater than zero. It's not going to be just two and negative two. So we cannot just add four and square root both sides. That would be finding the zeros, it's treating this like an equation, but rather we, we have to find the zeros and then find the interval, all the other x values that cause x squared minus four to be greater than zero. So while you can add four and square root both sides to get the zeros, you have to recognize that this is not asking us to find where x squared minus four is equal to zero, but rather where is it greater than zero? So ultimately we need to find the zeros and then we need to test around those zeros to determine what other values cause x squared minus four to be positive or greater than zero. I prefer, rather than adding four and square rooting both sides, and an example like this, I would prefer to actually factor this. So what I would recommend doing is that you go ahead and factor it, and factoring allows you to quickly see the zeros. So you know your zeros are negative two and positive two, which you're then gonna put on the number line, and you're gonna test around those zeros. So let me demonstrate the testing. I'm gonna pick a number that is smaller than negative two, let's say negative three, a number in between negative two and two, zero is nice, and a number bigger than two. And these are gonna be my testing values. And I am gonna test those back. You can test those back into the factored form, or you can test those back into x squared minus four, whichever you prefer. On this one, it's pretty easy to test it back into x squared minus four. So if I substitute negative three, negative three squared minus four is nine minus four, which is positive five. So the output, it results in a positive output, a positive number. If I substitute in zero, zero squared minus four is zero minus four, which is negative four. So it results in a negative output. And if I substitute in three, three squared minus four is nine, nine minus four is five, I get another positive. And because we want to have ultimately an output that is greater than zero, you can see that my solutions are gonna be all of these x values that are smaller than negative two and all of these x values that are greater than positive two. However, I don't want it to equal zero, so I'm not actually going to include the zeros. So I would put parentheses to indicate we are not actually including those zeros. So my domain, will be all of the x values from negative infinity to negative two, parenthesis union two to positive infinity. These are all the possible values of x that will uh, be in the domain of this function. Now, let me mention an alternative to this testing business. If you're a person that prefers not to test, okay, so I'm gonna erase, this testing seems tedious to you, let's say. You could certainly think graphically. And that's actually my preference on something like this. When you have x squared minus four, you could think about the graph of y equals x squared minus four, which is a parabola that opens up. 
and we found the zeros, which are essentially the x-intercepts. So if you think about what this would look like graphically, y equals x squared minus 4 would be this parabola that crosses the x-axis at negative 2 and at positive 2. And if I'm interested in the portion of this parabola that's greater than 0, then that's essentially like asking what part of the parabola is above the x-axis. And you can see we have two portions of the parabola that lie above the x-axis, and those are the intervals from negative infinity to negative 2 and from 2 to infinity. So if you know graphically what the, uh, the function looks like, in this case the x squared minus 4, what we're trying to have be greater than 0, then you can use a graphical method to help you solve rather than doing the testing. That is entirely up to you.